Go ahead, Beth. Hi, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to moderate this conversation. Today's video conference is sponsored by the American Society of International Law New Professionals Interest Group and also the ICL Interest Group. It's part of a new series the ASIL is launching called Getting Started, which is meant to bring together young lawyers um, and young professionals with more seasoned individuals working in the field of international law with an eye towards giving people some advice on moving into the field, on navigating the field, and generally embarking on a career in that area. This is the first program we've conducted um, entirely online, so thanks for everyone for their patience and understanding if we have a few uh, little glitches along the way. Um, we have participants here from The Hague, New York, California, and we've got viewers, as far as I know, from all over the world, so we're really pleased to welcome everyone. Um, as a reminder, if you have questions while you're watching this video conference, you can email those questions to the American Society, and they will shoot them over to me as moderator, and I'll post them to our, um, our participants. And the address would be events at ASIL.org. Again, that's events at ASIL.org. Folks over at Tiller House will shoot those uh, over to me. So let's get started. I'm Beth Van Scock. I am the Leah Kaplan Visiting Professor of Human Rights at Stanford Law School. Prior to holding this post, I was deputy in the Office of Criminal Justice at the State Department, working for the Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues. I've also been a law professor. I've been in private practice. I was at the Prosecutor's Office of the ICTY, so a long history in this field. Um, I'm very pleased that we're going to be joined by a number of um, experts in international criminal law who've really approached the field from a number of different perches. So we've got Marie-Sophie Poulain, who uh, upon graduating worked for the Federal Courts of Appeal in Canada. She's also served at the Crown Prosecution's Office in British Columbia and was legal counsel to a panel of judges in the Alberta Court of Appeal. She's now in The Hague and started working there in 2010 with, as trial counsel in the Office of the Prosecutor of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. We also have Michelle Oliel, who serves as an associate legal officer in Chambers, so working for the judges in the ICTY. She's also the founder founder of the Sahih, which is a nonprofit organization that serves um, child victims of forced labor and exploitation in Kenya. She's been a longtime human rights lawyer. She serves as a human rights consultant for the Talski Center for Human Rights of Women and Children and is a social media advisor for the UN Office of Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs in Sudan. Uh, we've also got Elizabeth Turchi here, who's the director of the Human Rights Institute at Keene University, which oversees a whole range of human rights programs, including an academic program on the Holocaust and on genocide studies. She served as the legal advisory team to the UN Assistant Secretary General for the Special Tribunal for Lebanon in The Hague, and she's also served as an associate legal officer um, at the ICTY, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, also in The Hague. There she was with the Victims and Witnesses Unit. And finally, we have Philip La Rochelle, who's a partner in the law firm of Roy La Rochelle Avocat in Montreal. He was admitted to the list of counsels for the ICC and also the ICTY. And in that capacity, uh, he represented Calixte Mbar Shamana during appellate proceedings before the Rwanda Tribunal, the ICTR. He's defended several other institutions, before, other individuals before that tribunal, and also um, within his home system in Canada. He's worked on two cases before the Committee Against Torture, which is one of the treaty bodies formed by one of the human rights treaties that can take individual complaints. Um, he's also admitted on the list of counsel's office of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. And in that capacity, he's been assigned to protect the interests and rights of one of the accused in the in absentia proceedings that are going forward. So we have individuals who've worked on the defense side and the prosecution side, as well as individuals who've worked for a number of different tribunals. Um, we may be joined later by Kweku van der Puye, who's um, a senior trial lawyer for the ICC. He's now lead counsel in the Bemba case, which is the Central African Republic situation. Um, and the case new ground for being devoted to crimes against the administration of justice. Prior to joining the ICC, he served uh, for eight years as trial counsel in the ICTY, where he worked on a number of important cases, including Popovich, uh, genocide case, and the Mladic case. Before going to the ICTY, he was a defense counsel in the United States um, and served for the Legal Aid Society um, Criminal Defense Division. We're having some technical issues there, but we're hoping that he can join us later. So I'd like to get us started by just inviting our participants to talk a little bit about um, what a typical day is for them. Um, you know, how do they what, do they, what do they do all day, what challenges do they face, um, who do they end up working with, et cetera. And then we'll maybe back up and have people talk a little bit about how 
they entered the field and give some advice to folks on the line here participating. So maybe, um, Michelle, if you want to start us off. Or Elizabeth, if uh, you're available. Yes, hi. Thank you for having me. So I'll make it clear that I started uh, working in the ICTY before moving to the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, but in both capacities was with the registry, which is the um, neutral organ of the tribunals that works to um, administer the, the, smooth, uh, the smooth running of the trials and is a administrative and diplomatic arm of the tribunals. So the daily role that I had in each tribunal was to implement and utilize international law, international public and private law, and not necessarily touch upon the international cases themselves because I was a neutral. Um, so the daily role for me was to administer contracts, oversee staffing within the tribunals, and in particular, the ICTY, the victims unit, was to interact with the governments to ensure that the victims and the witnesses were able to come and testify. So a lot of it was international governmental relations and communications on a daily basis. And at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, it's quite similar um, in working with the registry team to ensure uh, victims and witnesses are traveling, that the contracts that we need to administer and operate and to interact daily with um, our host state, the Netherlands, and the uh, and the state of Lebanon. Great, thank you, Marie Sophie. Do you want to chime in now? Yes, thank you. Um, before I um, say anything, I have to say that I'm appearing today in my private capacity, and that nothing I say can be imputed to the Special Tribunal for Lebanon or to the Office of the Prosecutor sure, of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Now that I've said that, um, um, well, working for the uh, Office of the Prosecutor from, day, from the day I started, which was more than five years ago now, everything is about um, how we're going to put our case forward and how we're going to prove the allegations against um, the accused, which at this time we didn't have. So it was about reviewing the evidence and um, um, putting together an, an indictment which was submitted for review um, by the pretrial judge. The, um, the indictment was confirmed. Um, this was a, a step that I was not used to in domestic practice because this, this is uh, not the way it, it works in Canada. But um, uh, once the indictment was confirmed, it was about uh, preparing our case for, for, for trial with respect to interviewing witnesses, preparing our evidence list, um, and um, uh, meeting with investigators to discuss uh, potential uh, leads we had, uh, the way we wanted to uh, package our evidence. Um, later, there were uh, motions for protective measures for our witnesses. Um, and basically uh, always anticipating issues that might arise at trial which uh, needed uh, preparation. Um, so this, this is really what I think the daily and weekly life of a trial counsel for the Office of the Prosecutor entails. Thank you. Philippe, your thoughts? Yes. I, I, I'm on the other. Um, so, um, we are basically, well, I have to stress that we are put in this uh, very strange situation where we don't have clients, really. So, um, <laughs> there's a bit of uh, searching of exactly go and what we can do to uh, protect the interest of these, um, of the people, of, of, the, of the people whose interest we're representing. So, but a typical day uh, would entail uh, going to the STL. If there are hearings, then most of the time I would be in court. Um, if there are not, then there's a massive amount of information that we have received from the prosecutor, and we are still in the process of um, reading, analyzing, analyzing, and annotating. Um, and there's um, so basically, that's um, as a defense counsel at the STL. That's what we do. 
Wonderful. I think there's I a think real, real dilemma uh, what we can do. Sorry? No, carry on. Sorry, I thought you were finished. No, no. No, no, no. I, I was just uh, emphasizing the, 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 the weird situation we find ourselves in. So uh, it's not only working about the case, but it's also um, working together what, what we can do, what we should do. For example, uh, sh should we even present a defense? Should we, uh, how far should we investigate? I mean, there's all sorts of ethical consideration that come into play when you are put into this situation. So the, 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 the work, the typical work of a defense counsel, of course, which is uh, perusing the, 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 the disclosure, try, making sure that it's complete and that there's not missing anything, um, and finding ways of undermining the case, as always, but and then added to that is this layer of um, well, exactly what I'm saying, you know, the layer of difficulties arising from the fact that we don't say. Thank you. I see we've had Queco has joined us. I'm just going to test and see whether he's able to be heard by our participant. No, I'm afraid not. Sorry, Queco. We'll have to <laughs> we'll have to hold the line on that. Um, and I think we've lost Michelle as well, so I'm going to let her get herself sorted back in. Um, maybe if I could ask everyone to talk a little bit about how they came to international criminal law. Many of you I see have a background in your own domestic practice and also potentially domestic criminal law, either on the defense or the prosecution side. And just what, what, was, what enabled you to make that leap into the international field? Um, maybe we can start with Marie-Sophie. Okay. Um... I, um, after clerking, I've only uh, worked very, very briefly for the defense for about uh, six to eight months for a criminal uh, boutique firm in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, from that moment on, I was always with the Crown Office. Um, and uh, I practiced in both British Columbia and Alberta. And I, I really loved criminal law, but I wanted to work on a, on a big case, and um, I felt like this, they were difficult to come around in, in domestic uh, practice. I mean, in, in Vancouver, we had the Air India case, but um, uh, otherwise, the big cases really are, I think, held here in The Hague. Um, the, the work I did for the Alberta Court of Appeal uh, was a, a language rights appeal case and I'm talking to you about that because it affected a very large um, contingent of French residents in the northern uh, territories in Canada and I think the impact that it had on me because it affected a whole community um, bolstered my desire to work not only on a big criminal case but on a, on a big case that affected more than one or a handful of, of victims and um, after uh, having worked in Canada for about five years uh, I applied for a job here in The Hague and what it should I should say is that it, it took a very very long time it's a very long process um, from the moment I applied to the moment I interviewed and started working um, but that's how I got into this field of, of international criminal law. Thank you. Michelle, I see you've joined us. We've, we were talking a little bit about how individuals made the leap from a domestic legal practice into international criminal law, and you've had a very interesting background in that you've also done what would be more considered straight human rights work. Um, oh, we've just lost Michelle, so I'll hold that question. Um, Philippe, do you want to talk a little bit? You've had a, a role in a, it sounds like you're a named partner in a law firm, um, have had a domestic practice of international criminal law, also in Canada, but how did you make the, the leap into international criminal law? It was a bit of an accident, actually. Um, so I was three years into the bar in, in Quebec, and um, I was offered a job at Mecartier Trois, which is a big firm in Montreal, and um, the conditions were so that I decided to take a couple of months to travel. Immediately after that, a lawyer I knew who was defending one of the accused at the ICTR asked me whether I could go and meet the accused. Uh, so I, I took the, um, I accepted the, the mission. So I spent a week uh, in Arusha in prison with Mr. Mumpaka, who was uh, the, 
who was the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs during the genocide in Rwanda. And from that week, I, I knew this is what I wanted to do. So uh, I tried to negotiate with the law firm to be allowed what they were expecting to do, but that fell out. So uh, that was in 2001. And that case, the, the guy was acquitted in 2011. So that's my first 10 years then, uh, there in, in international criminal law. And there was another case at the um, ICTR after that, one case at the ICC, uh, one case in Canada. Uh, I still maintain a, a, a local practice in Canada, but it's obviously very difficult now that I'm um, more permanently in The Hague, but I still go back once in a while to, um, to do my... And I do commercial law and, and normal criminal law, if you can call it like that. Uh, back in Montreal, where I have my uh, but the, the leap was really a, an accident, uh, and uh, this is how I, I started being involved in the field. Can, can you speak a little bit, Philippe, I, about being on li the list of counsel? I see that you're on the list of counsel for a number of different tribunals, and I know that's a way that many people get into doing defense work before these yeah. tribunals. How would individuals get on those lists? What are they looking for in terms of qualifications? What's the the procedures by which you got on those lists? That's interesting because there's been uh, uh, an improvement in how they uh, allow people to be part of these lists because uh, the ICTR, it was, uh, you needed initially 10 years of experience in your local jurisdiction and, you know, to be in good standing with your bar and that was it. Whereas now at the STL, for example, the, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, they actually uh, interview you before they put you on the list. Um, they, they have mandatory uh, training, so they, they have uh, um, restricted a little bit um, the, the the possibility of getting on this list. Uh, at, the, uh, at the ICC, I, I would say it's, it's halfway between the ICTR and the STL. You still need to um, present a, a file with, you know, you, you have to, you need 10 years, I think, to be a counsel. And you need to be in good standing, but that's that's not. Of, of course, there's uh, several hundred people um, on the ICC list, for example. So uh, you need more. Just being admitted on the list will not necessarily mean that the cases will start uh, pouring in. If I can say that. Great, right, thank you, Elizabeth. Do you want to speak a little bit about your experience? And you've also worked between different tribunals, so maybe you can speak a little bit about. First, how you broke into international criminal law, and then how you moved between tribunals. Uh, certainly. So, how did I get into this field? It actually was a long and arduous journey. Um, I didn't start out after law school right in international law at all. I was a private law in Philadelphia as a commercial litigation, but. I really did have a dream to do UN work and international work. So after practicing private law at domestic level for a few years, I uh, took a leap of faith to go after this dream of mine, and I resigned from my law firm position and went for a master's of law degree. And here in the United States, the LLM master's of law um, that you get after that you, you elect to get after your juris doctor, it's um, not a requirement to practice law in the United States, so it's less of a it's pretty rare to do uh, for, in some respects. So I utilize the LLM as a transformative tool to rebrand myself in the international arena and sphere. And I told myself that I would do whatever it took during the period of time I was studying for my LLM to gain the experience and rebrand myself as international and not just domestic. And so I took an internship. Um, actually, I started to study abroad to be international. I thought I want to work internationally. I should be international and go abroad while I study. And I started a semester in Japan. And the semester was just about to get started when the United Nations in New York informed me that had selected me for an internship. And so knowing the UN was my dream, I uh, basically packed up before the classes started, even though I had just um, finalized my apartment rent and everything over in mm. Tokyo, and I hightailed it back to New York City to intern for six months at the uh, ombudsman's office, which handled um, employment litigation within as the internal justice system. Um, wanting to do international law 
uh, I wanted to do international human rights. So um, again, I didn't get to do that right away. So the UN internship was drawing upon my private law experience, my, my litigation in the employment sphere. But I was just so thrilled to do something UN, so I, I, I you know, took it. Um, but after six months of interning in, in New York, due to the regulations they have on hiring processes, uh, interns aren't hired on right away. They have to separate for a while if there's an opening. So I um, continued to apply during that six-month internship for other internships and went and interned in Rome, Italy, uh, at the World Food Program. So collectively, I dedicated a year of my time uh, unpaid to, volunteer, to, to work with the UN and gain experience that would help me be international and look international with international experience. Um, but the posts within the UN are very uh, few and far between and competitive. So again, I didn't get that post right away. And so I worked in the most uh, international capacity that I could find a position at the time in Philadelphia at a university and continued to apply. And I applied at the ICTY for about a year, multiple times. Uh, but one day I got a call to interview for a temporary post. Now, most of the UN jobs are contractual in nature, unlike jobs in the United States that are at will situation. And so um, I decided again to take a leap of faith. And I resigned from my current job uh, that had a lot of stability to go after a temporary contract that was for only five months. And I moved, uh, again, picked it up and hightailed it to The Hague and worked uh, in the court management section of the tribunal for about one month. And in one month, I applied to the internal vacancies and moved over to the Victims and Witnesses Unit, where I was for um, several years. And then, with the closing of the tribunal and the achieving of its mandate, the reduction of staff, which is a challenge in reality that we may talk about later, I applied uh, to the Special Tribunal for Lebanon and through a competitive recruitment process was selected. Um, drawing to again work at the registry, I was at the registry as I noted earlier in the ICTY, and it was that internal experience at the registry that made me a competitive recruit for the registry uh, position at the SCL. It was a long journey. That's it's great. It's it's a it's a story I've heard with other individuals who've broken into the field. I just want to maybe circle back to a couple of things you mentioned. First being the internship issue, and I should emphasize that all of the tribunals do have internship programs. They're generally unpaid, and so it is a commitment of time and resources in order to pursue that. But it is a great way to get an introduction to the field. You can do it while you're a student. They have a six-month commitment, so often it requires taking a semester abroad, um, but many law schools I know will allow that and actually will give students credit for that, that period while they're gone and they have to write a series of reflection papers potentially in order to get that credit, or you can take a leave of absence in order to pursue that. Um, and the, the rule you mentioned that the, most of the UN bodies <laughs> cannot hire immediately out of their internship program. There is a requirement that you um, sort of step back for six months, but my understanding, and let me know if I'm wrong here, but that you can actually apply for jobs in other UN institutions. So it's not a UN-wide rule, it's an institution rule. So, for example, if you participate in an internship in the ICTY, you're not eligible to apply for the ICTY, but you would be eligible to apply for positions in other tribunals. And so it is uh, something you have to factor in when you're thinking about the invest making the investment in an internship program. Does anyone else want to weigh in on their current institution or, or one of their past institutions internship program and uh, the opportunities that that affords to young professionals in this field? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, yes. Parker. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, I can weigh in if you'd like. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. Um, at the ICC, the um, internship program uh, uh, is unpaid, as, as you mentioned, um, but I think it, it does present um, certainly young professionals with a, with, a, with a wealth of experience and also an opportunity to participate, at least in the office of the prosecutor, participate in active cases, active investigations, and active prosecutions. Um, there used to be a, a circumstance where interns could be paid. They were paid a nominal amount, which enabled them to survive while they were here in The Hague. Um, but they've cut that back since uh, 
uh, I think related to the budget budgetary issues. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the opportunities abound um, in various parts of the of the of the court in the registry. Uh, chambers, Office of the Prosecution, in terms of investigations, Prosecution Division, um, Jurisdiction Cooperation Division uh, as well. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many uh, interns uh, come into the Office of the Prosecutor every every few months, um, but it's somewhere in the area of around six or seven of them, um, usually. At the ICTY, it, it tended to, to vary more, depending on um, where in the uh, mandate the uh, the trial was occurring or, or the activity was occurring. So towards the end of the mandate now, there are fewer interns than there were earlier. Um, when I was on the Mladish case, we had probably upwards of 10 alone on that case. Um, and obviously, we received a lot of uh, training in terms of trial practice and on a trial team. Some cases, drafting motions, doing research, and all of the things you might expect um, that they would do as a paralegal or something like that in a, in a large firm. Um, so it's, I think it's a very fruitful way in, um, I think it's Elizabeth who, who mentioned that, I think it's a very fruitful way in um, to this sort of uh, work. Um, and uh, we do tend to keep a lot of uh, the interns that we do hire for a, for a long time. We, we have, in some cases, converted their contracts or converted their internships to uh, short-term contracts and they've stayed on in that way to, to gain further experience. Marie Sophie, can you talk a little bit about, if you know, about internships at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon? Um, we do also have uh, interns who uh, who come to work with us from all over the world. Um, usually, uh, for never less than um, four to six months. Usually, six months is a, mm -hmm. a, a typical uh, duration for an internship, um, and it, it's very interesting because the interns have very different backgrounds. So some of them are, well, I mean, they're all law, law uh, students or graduates, of course, but some of them are, they're, are still in law school or fresh out of law school. However, others have a great deal of uh, domestic experience. And so uh, it's, a, it's a bit related to what um, uh, Liz was uh, saying earlier about taking a leap of faith and, and trying. Um, so some of them, some of these people also have stayed on with us, like Kweku was saying, um, after their internships. But, but the expectations for us, anyway, in the office of the prosecutor should, uh, should be low uh, because it's, uh, it's a very, very small percentage of interns who have stayed and the ones who have were there at the very beginning. So now there's less of a need to, to hire interns at this stage. Uh, but I think that the interns who have come have had a great experience work, working for the OTP anyway. That's helpful. Just as a law professor who's taught in this field for about 15 years, I can say that I've had a, you know dozens at this point of students who have participated in internships and they've all had the same experience, been extremely positive, they've loved working in an international environment with lawyers drawn from legal systems all over the world, the sort of comparative law opportunities are fascinating, plus the idea of, of really building a new field, the, the new field of international criminal law now. And many of them have moved from an internship situation to a short-term contract, a series of short-term contracts that they've sort of strung together. Um, and the, the closing of the tribunals, which I do want to, the ad hoc tribunals, which I do want to come to, has in some respects created some opportunities for young professionals because there are a number of these short-term contracts being handed out as cases come to a close, but they have additional appellate work to be done or follow-up work. And so people are having to live their lives through a series of, of short-term contracts being strung together, which is a little nerve-wracking, I think, as you get more seasoned in your career, but younger people can maybe handle that level of uncertainty. So I think the, the theme so far of this morning's session has been leap of faith, and I think that's really borne out in many of the experiences of my own students and, and people on this uh, on the call. Kweku, while your microphone is working, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about working on both the defense and the prosecution side. So in your home district in the United States, 
You were a longtime defense lawyer, um, very committed, working on the legal aid organizations and elsewhere. And then as you made the move into international criminal law, you flipped. And now you're on the prosecution side, both for the Yugoslavia Tribunal and for the ICC. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about how you made that transition and what it feels to be on different sides of, uh, of a case? Um, yes, as you mentioned, I was, a, I was a criminal defense attorney, pretty much a career, a career um, defense attorney. <laughs> For about 14 years before I came to The Hague. Um, I had a lot of uh, uh, contact with people um, that were not precisely in this field, but were doing international work, and I had the idea that it would be an interesting thing to do. Um, I wasn't sure at the time that uh, I wanted to do, whether I wanted to do uh, defense work internationally or prosecution work internationally. But I did know that I wanted to do this kind of work because I thought it was important to contribute to it, and, and I thought it would be interesting, um, an interesting uh, an avenue to pursue. So I, um, I I ran into a couple of people, and I decided that I would apply for a job, and so I set out and I, and I put in a couple of applications to the uh, ICTY and also to the ICTR. I think I might have dropped one or two at the SC uh, SL and uh, some other places. Um, but sooner or later, I got a call from the ICTY, and it, uh, it turned out that um, it was for a, a possible trial attorney prosecution position. Um, and I thought long and hard about it before I before I decided to take it, because <clears throat> principally, as a public defender, I was very dedicated to doing defense work and only defense work. Um, but you know, some pe sometimes people ask me, well, how is it like being a defense attorney and now being a prosecutor? And I don't really see it as flipping sides at all. Um, as a public defender, I think uh, my view of it was that, uh, that I was acting as a sort of a buffer between people that were in positions of power and were subjugating people that were not in a position of power, that were disenfranchised. Um, and I don't really see that much of a difference in what I'm doing now, which is essentially prosecuting people that are in positions of power that have been or are alleged to have been uh, abusive of that power and subjugating people that are disenfranchised. So it's essentially the same, it's the same um, job, the same position, um, but it's at a different scale um, than it was um, when I was back in New York. Uh, when I first arrived, I, I described it as, as a public defender, your work is very broad in the sense that you have tons and tons of cases that you have to deal with. Um, in these kinds of situations, they are more in depth. Um, there are obviously numerous crimes that make up these, these kinds of uh, grand scale offenses, but fundamentally you're dealing with one case, and you're dealing with one case for a very long time, very, very in depth. Um, very, very detailed. So um, there isn't that much of a difference in terms of the mentality the way which I approach the job. I approach it very clinically. I did that both as a public defender and as a, and I do as a prosecutor. Um, I think there's a tendency sometimes for people to conflate the idea of <clears throat> social mores or moral equivalent uh, with legal uh, with legal notions. Um, and I try to avoid that. I think that's it's probably a, a, a unique thing that I do, but it's, it's, I think it's important to make that distinction. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that's how I'm able to kind of rationalize um, working on both sides and doing this kind of work. It's like a doctor. Um, it doesn't make any difference who your patient is. The system works fundamentally the same. You do the same work. Um, and whether or not you're fixing the bone of a, of a bad guy or a good guy, you fix it the same way, the problems are the same. Um, so fundamentally, that's, that's uh, how I view it. Great. Thank you for that. Um, just a reminder for our participants out there in the field, if you have questions that you would like me to pose to our uh, speakers here, please email them to events at ASIL.org. That's events at ASIL.org. SIL.org, and I can uh, be happy to pose them to our um, to our participants. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the idea of doing international work in private practice. I know Philippe has uh, worked in that area, and maybe some of the other ones of you 
have in your past done a short stint uh, either with a private law firm um, or even on your own as a solo practitioner. For my part, I was at Morrison and Forster for several years after the ICTY, um, in part because I ran out of money, honestly. <laughs> so I needed to pay off loans and, and also, actually, frankly, was was looking forward to having some uh, more formalized legal training, and I was able to get that in private practice. Um, in the United States, we've had opportunities for um, Alien Tort Litigation and Torture Victim Protection Act litigation, and, and after Keogh Bell, those opportunities have contracted somewhat, but Philippe, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, trying to build a practice in international issues and work, but through a private practice. It's, it's um, from a defense perspective, uh, international criminal law is very volatile. I mean, um, there, when you think of it, there aren't that many cases. Uh, there are a lot of lawyers who are um, interested in, in doing them. So for me, it has always been important to maintain uh, local practice because I was never, um, we, we are sort of, Consultants, you know, uh, as working for the defense, so there is no um, there is no permanency in what we do. It's it's we are hired on a case by case basis, and then we are uh, scavenging for the next one. So um, it's it's um, it's very difficult on that level. So that's why I, I've seen, especially as the ICTR, when in the early years there were a lot of people that were just um, staying there, and you know they were not they had not qualified. I think it's important when you start to um, to have qualified with your local bar um, when you actually uh, start working in these organizations because I've seen people working five six years and postponing uh, actually qualifying for their bar and, and being stuck after their cases ended at the ICTR not finding a job so um, I've been lucky enough to, to to find cases locally and interesting ones I, I found a genocide case that uh, was approached by a client in Canada uh, uh, the second one in genocide case uh, in Ontario, which I did. Uh, I, I had cases before in torture. So, but it's not, I cannot say that uh, I'm only doing that. I'm always ready um, to go back to my firm in Montreal and, and maybe not doing it for a couple of months or maybe even years. I'm not, I have no, uh, um, there is no, um, there are very, very, very few lawyers who can claim to do that on a permanent basis on the defense side. So, and I don't want to, you know, I must feed my kids and family. So for me, uh, it's important to to, um, to to maintain this local practice in Montreal and to, um, to, to, um, to be ready to go back there. But now I'm living in The Hague with my family uh, for the last two years because I've been working at the SCL. But um, I'm, I'm now considering going back in. Uh, I just don't want to be stuck in a position where um, uh, this case will finish and I'll be in the middle of the school year, for example. Uh, that would be complicated. So, um, I, I, from a defense perspective, I can maybe uh, sum it up to that. Um, it's it's uh, there's a lot of uncertainty as to what your next case is going to be. So I think personally that it is important to be, to be well anchored in your local jurisdiction. Great, that's very helpful advice. Uh, I know just one other option for doing this work in private practice is asylum work. Um, you often have um, a pro bono practice associated with um, even medium sized but often big law firms and doing asylum cases is a way to use the same norms in a different procedural setting. It's an asylum administrative setting but it's still a way to work on behalf of victims of human rights abuses and gain a familiarity with the norms. So we've had a question from one of our, our watchers um, and it's sort of an obvious one which is how on earth do you manage if you're either a law student or a young professional with even loans to deal with and the only internship opportunities are unpaid? So I'd be interested in getting some strategic advice from folks on the call um, about basically how to fund this. Um, I can just speak quickly from my side. I was able to win a fellowship right out of law school that funded my work at the ICTY for two years and then I also went to the Center for Justice and Accountability in San Francisco with that fellowship. Um, but I, I'll open it up and maybe Elizabeth could start since she clearly navigated this um, whole dilemma quite quite successfully. Um, yeah, yes, thank you. So from my own personal experience, you I heard me mention that I interned for a year 
Um, I did that after I was a practicing attorney for several years. So all ego aside, after practicing as a professional for several years, I plunged myself back into that internship role. Um, and it wasn't easy. And I spent all of my savings that I had amassed while I was a practicing attorney to do that because I lived in quite expensive locations, New York and Rome. But I failed to mention that the World Trade Program actually did pay a stipend to its interns. So first and foremost, if you um, have a financial constraint, as I did, seek out those in internships within the UN system that, pay, that do pay stipends. Some do, not all. Generally, the secretariat does not. Um, so that's the first first thing. Um, but I and I did not do this myself. But as working in different capacities, different tribunals, I saw interns who um, were able to fund their time there through either um, a fellowship or through searching on their own for a grant. So they would apply for a research grant and be self-funded. To come and work for the you know the tribunals, but also could, you know research and do whatever they needed to do, um, and the payment for that that grant and research allowed them to survive and stay um, in in the Hague or in, in these expensive cities. Um, that has to be cleared with the tribunals, though, for permission that they know you're there and you're also researching while you are interning. Um, some also um, go through, and while they're obtaining a PhD, they have a paid PhD program to research. And they take a portion of their, their paid PhD experience and, and, and volunteer at, or serve as interns in the various um, entities throughout the UN. Um, and like I said, I was at the UN HQ in New York and in Rome with the World Food Program. The HQ that was part of the Secretariat and the World Food Program was not. So some of the rules that related to interns were different. And it's important to know that because it's not one homogenous set of rules and procedures and hiring practices uh, throughout the entire UN system. That's very helpful. I can recall having been an intern at the ICTY that there were a number of, of homes in um, families in The Hague that rented out rooms to interns and so another option is to be in touch with current interns and other staffers at the tribunals to ask around about sort of short-term rental options, sublets, etc. Um, there was one I remember Indonesian woman that took a number of, of interns in and she would actually cook for everybody so you know we were constantly wanting invitations over to that house because the food was fabulous. Um, anyone else with advice on sort of how to fund the bridge from either law school into this world or from a, a career change, um, from a more lucrative private practice or other practice into the necessity of taking an unpaid internship. I think Elizabeth's covered it just about all. Um, many of the interns that we receive are young professionals who are already working in some cases and they're taking time off. Um, a, fair, a fair number of them also do come from schools. Um, but because of the, they're, they're here for a very limited period of time, two, three months or something like this, it's not that much different than, um, than basically surviving, uh, for example, over a summer or a summer vacation between school years. Um, and a lot of them are funded by their parents and, and that kind of thing as well. Um, but no, normally, we, we find the people that are coming are, they've already completed school, um, and they are already embarking on a career, and sometimes they have been able to save a certain amount of money just during the last, you know, the couple of months that the internship, um, the duration of the internship. And as I mentioned, in, in, at the ICC in particular, there have been circumstances where interns have been able to uh, stay on for these kind of short time, although they're, those have been kind of fewer and far in between. That's very helpful. We have another um, question here and a little uh, shout out to Liz. So basically someone um, has emailed us that they were very involved in international criminal justice issues extracurricularly in law school, graduated in 2013, went to the ICTY with an internship. Thank you to Liz for helping to secure that. Hi. Um, uh, now he's working for a civil law firm doing securities fraud. He's committed to staying in suburban Philadelphia for family reasons um, when his daughter graduates from high school. But the question is, what can I do to keep myself involved in international criminal law and get my name out there until I'm ready to make the jump? Uh, question, uh, suggestions from our panelists. Uh, 
Well, maybe I'll just start. Um, obviously, staying involved with the American Society, a little plug for the Society, is a great opportunity to do that. There are a number of interest groups. Some are more active than others. The International Criminal Law Interest Group is extremely active. Um, it's being led by uh, Meg de Guzman at Temple, actually, who I'm sure you know, living in Philadelphia. Um, and I think she's co-chairing that with someone uh, now. But there's a number of workshops where people present papers. There's the mid-year meeting that happens every year that um, gets people together, and then, of course, the annual meeting that's happening in April of this year. Um, but suggestions from others on the on the call. Uh, Philippe, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, here's a suggestion. Um, first, of course, to get on their list of councils of the ICC. Um, uh, and then also, uh, they have yearly training sessions for defense councils, um, and they invite their lawyers that are on the list. So that's a great way the great networking opportunity to meet all the councils, those who have cases, um, they're all usually um, present during this, these training sessions. Anyway, if, if he's open to do some defense work, um, that's a possible way of uh, getting into the field. Anyone else? One thing I can think of is um, after having um, been part of um, hiring panels for um, trial councils or, or senior trial councils at the STL, I was struck sometimes how little people knew about, how little applicants knew about what we were doing. So I would say to um, make sure you stay up to date with um, um, with uh, the bigger decisions of the trial chamber and the appeals chamber, <coughs> without saying, and uh, the various bulletins that we have s uh, stating what basically has been accomplished in you know the last few months, etc., um, so that you don't have too much catching up to do, I suppose, when we, when it's time for for an interview. Um, that's that's all I can think of. That's very helpful. So two things I would just pull out from those comments. One is the idea of continuing training. I think that's a great idea. Organizations such as Justice Rapid Response or the uh, Institute for International Criminal Investigations, the Auschwitz Institute, the U.S. Holocaust Museum, they all do a number of trainings and conferences. And so getting on those listservs and, and becoming aware of those events I think is a really important way to stay involved. And then um, Marie-Sophie's advice about staying current is really a good one. Um, all of the tribunals have a little sort of listserv that you can sign up for. There's also a number of blogs that do a really wonderful job of covering this work. So some of them are obviously Just Security, um, Int Law Girls, the International Criminal Law Bureau has a blog that's excellent. I love Justice in Conflict, Mark Kirsten's um, blog. Uh, Lawfare, which tends to be a little more national security oriented, um, but nonetheless covers it. Opinio Juris has people, uh, Kevin John Heller, who cover you know very current events. So getting on those blogs and reading those regularly, I think, is a great way to stay um, connected with the field. So I have another question that has come in, in fact, a couple of them. So let me fire these out. Um, one is basically a question of, um, how do you contribute to the development of international criminal law? Many of you are practicing in the field, um, but here's a, a student who's an SJD candidate um, in international law with an LLB and an LLM and, and is interested in continuing to promote the development. Um, obviously, scholarship would be a, a opportunity to do that, but do you see yourselves also as involved in developing and promoting the field? Kweku, maybe you can. Yeah, I would say I would say yes for sure. Um, first, I agree with you completely that scholarship is one way, is a good way to go about it. That's also that also dovetails with the last point that you made um, that uh, Marie uh, Sophie made in terms of staying current in the field. Right? Um, if it's possible to publish articles and research these material, research these issues, you know, you can seize on just a narrow issue um, and seize on that issue and develop it and work on that, um, which will help keep you current for future interviews, as well as um, as well as uh, move you forward in terms of contributing to the to the field in general. So, both in terms of practice, I think um, the practice certainly here at the ICC is. Is uh, it's 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 um, it's growing, um, and it's uh, it's very uh, 
very sophisticated practice, and it's important, I think, in terms of our going forward from the point of view of the Office of the Prosecutor, anyway, to develop to develop the jurisprudence in a way that is uh, beneficial, really, for everyone, and and uh, certainly for moving the, uh, the field forward. So, in that sense, I think we contribute, but also um, personally. Um, yeah, I've tried to write articles, tried to research issues, try to bring these kinds of things to the fore, litigate these matters. Um, um, I litigated many many issues uh, that I thought moved the ball forward at the ICPI as well as here, um, raising these issues as well. So I think in that sense, um, it is a very active practice internationally, and the practitioners really do move the ball forward. There's a lot of room for that. Uh, in international criminal law, much more so than, uh, for example, domestic law. So um, the idea of scholarship, I think, is really important. And just to, to emphasize a couple of places, um, there's two journals that are really devoted to this field, and it's the Journal of International Criminal Justice and the International Criminal Law Review. What I like about both of those journals is they have a, a little bit of a more short form approach. They don't expect a sort of 60 page article with 500 footnotes. They might do much more in the nature of um, you know, late breaking news or as Kweku says, more narrow issues that you can really dive into and become a real expert on. Um, the American Society of International Law has a number of short form options as well, insights, etc. And so getting your name on there and offering to do a sort of current event or a recent decision, a recent development. Um, and then Introducing yourself to the editors of the various blogs is always a great. They're always looking for good content, and so if you can become a dependable sort of reader and pro, you know to, to sort of analyze the current developments, it's a way for you to keep involved in the field, get your name out there, participate in these conversations about the development of the field, you know, offer critiques as appropriate, etc. Um, I have a couple of more questions that are, are somewhat more sobering, and so I thought I would just throw them out there so that we are not overly sanguine about the opportunities in this field, particularly with the ad hoc tribunals really shutting down and not on a full-scale hiring program. Um, we have a couple of questions from individuals who are uh, running in from developing countries who don't have maybe the resources to draw on to work for free for six months. and. Um, it was noted that it's a shame that there's not more fellowships in this area. And so um, maybe for those of us out here who eventually will win the lottery, that's something we can really think about devoting our resources to is putting together short-term fellowships to enable students to do this work. I should say that the Helton Fellowship through the American Society is a fellowship that has sent students to the various tribunals. It's geared towards human rights more broadly, but I think the case can be made that um, you know, being having a post at a tribunal is an important opportunity um, in the human rights field, particularly as Kweku has said, you're working on the defense side, pr promoting due process rights um, in international criminal justice, which really um, is is uh, somewhat of a new field. Um, and so, you know, encouraging people to their law schools. I know that um, obviously Stanford is a very wealthy law school, but even Santa Clara Law School, where I've been on the faculty. There are some discretionary funds that deans have at their disposal, and so a very compelling proposal from a recent graduate who just needs a little bit of money to sort of make something happen can be um, either the dean discretionary funds could potentially fund that, or we've actually reached out to graduates that have been successful in their legal careers, and they've sponsored some of our students to enable them to take advantage of opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise be able to take advantage to. So let's, um, you know, let's all of us think about ways um, in the future and to avoid the system becoming elitist, as one of our um, writers has written in. Um, I have another question here. Several people have said it's important to start applying for jobs early. And so a question of timing. What is the time frame for jobs in the tribunals and in the UN more generally, particularly if they're looking at a June graduation date? Um, may I start? Yeah, please. Thank you. Be please, because I think my um, my experience was out of this world in the sense that I remember applying for a position with the STL. Um, I think it was in February of of two thousand and eight, um, and and I had an interview. Uh, in September of 2009 um, and I didn't hear anything between the moment I applied and the moment I interviewed 
um, at which point I I thought okay I you know I'm just gonna move on to something else I can't keep waiting to hear for from this from this opportunity and but from the moment I had the interview um, I had an offer two weeks later and I started so the interview was in September 2009 and the, and I started in January 2010 so I think from the moment the ball gets rolling things actually start to happen but sometimes positions are advertised but but there's no immediate need to to fill them uh, in our case it was such a big investigation that although they had advertised positions for trial councils there, there was not necessarily a need to fill them at the time uh, and that's what happened so so it's, it's a delicate question I would say not to um, not to put all your eggs in the egg basket that would be a, a very big mistake I think you want to make sure you put your name out there and that you try um, and you make yourself known but you know it's um, it's um, it's a very different world if I if I can put it this way in the sense that everything is is slower in in this forum. Anyone else want to weigh in on the timing question? That's a story I've heard from others to say that they they apply for something and it's radio silence for months and months and then all of a sudden they are invited to interview and so. And I think it is helpful to know people on the inside who can kind of move your application maybe to the top of the pile or can make inquiries on your behalf um, as to what the timing is so that you know whether or not no news is bad news or maybe no news is simply that they haven't moved forward with the hiring process yet. Yes, it's, it's a well-known well sort of phenomena in, in applying for these kinds of jobs and, and there's been work uh, going on to kind of streamline the process and improve it. Uh, at least at the ICC uh, for the last uh, year or so, or a couple of years. Um, but unfortunately, there is a lot of inertia, and it takes a long time. So even if the name can be shuffled to the top of the deck, as it were, the process is such um, that it still takes a long time, no matter how, no matter how it's done. Um, some of that has to do with uh, budgeting issues. Some of that has to do with otherwise staffing issues. For example, an interview panel has to be composed of people that are otherwise in a whole function and may not be available at the time to engage in a large recruiting or recruitment effort. And so those are just kinds of the practicalities of of um, of, of, of hiring uh, in these organizations. So in terms of lead time, I would say apply as soon as you possibly can and apply to more than one place if you can, um, because uh, I think it, I think uh, Marie Sophie's right. It's it's not a good idea to put all your eggs in, in the one basket um, because you may find out uh, you might get a response to uh, an application where you're actually at the top of the list, but a year after you put in your application, and, and maybe wait even longer than that for an interview. So it's best to kind of spread out the risk. Um, and uh, apply as many uh, to as many places as you can in as early. The other thing to bear in mind is, because of the nature of these organizations, because they're internationalized, there are also uh, certain kinds of hiring considerations in terms of geographic location, gender, and so on and so forth that may account for certain hiring decisions that are made. And so, if you're not uh, called right away, that should not discourage you from from uh, applying and reapplying. It may not be the case that the panel considers you not qualified for the position, but just that you're not suitable for the position at the given moment in time. And so that's something you should always um, bear in mind. And uh, if you don't get it the first time, keep trying. Great. I had a, a quick question about clerkships. I know we're running up against the hour here, but I thought I'd throw that out here and then hope. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to just get some closing advice um, from our panelists, um, words of encouragement, etc. So we have a, a, a participant who asked, what are the thoughts about clerking? Um, obviously in the United States there's a very um, established practice of recent graduates of law school clerking for federal judges, state judges um, at the appellate or district level. Um, I know, Marie-Sophie, you worked in a sort of a, a, as a clerkship, in the clerkship capacity, but for the rest of you, I mean, is that a valuable stepping stone for students. I just from my side I can say I never clerked in part because I got the ICTY 
opportunity right out of law school, and I have to admit it's something I've always regretted not doing because it is it is such a unique experience, and everyone I've spoken to had really wonderful um, just understanding the judicial mind and the judicial process. So um, my recommendation would be to take advantage of that if you have the ability to, but I'd love to hear from the rest of, of the folks on the call. Well, Sophie, maybe you can start since you uh, clerk for your federal court of appeal. I'm I'm biased, so absolutely, clerk, if you can. Um, the higher, the better, but don't uh, the higher level of court. I mean, uh, the better, but don't um, don't. Um, um, how would I say that? Uh, let's say an opportunity for the higher courts does not arise. I think there could be very interesting clerkships to be had with lower level courts where you actually get to hear trials and uh, review evidence with um, with your your judges. I mean the the judges you work for. The thing about clerking uh, in an appeals court is that of course what you review is mostly transcripts and law. Now, the opportunity to sit in a trial and to discuss the evidence with a judge is also something extremely valuable that I did when I worked as a legal counsel, which was a similar uh, you know, position as a, as a glorified clerkship, if you will. But uh, I would say definitely clerk, and this is an, an experience that will um, enrich uh, the way you will approach the law, I think, for a long time to come. Great. Anyone else want to weigh in on this? Great. So we're running up against the end of the hour, so I thought I'd give each of our participants an opportunity for some final remarks, either words of encouragement or um, final advice to the young professionals who are out there watching and are interested in working in the field of international criminal justice. So maybe, Kweku, you could start us off? Yeah, as, as I mentioned before, I think one of the most important things uh, is to persevere, you know, follow the dream, make a plan, execute the plan, and don't give up. Um, I think that's a very important thing uh, to do in order to, to land that position. Um, the other thing is I think it's important to prepare yourself for it. Um, what I find sometimes when I've sat on interview panels is that sometimes a person gets through and they're lucky enough to get the interview, uh, but it's completely unprepared for that interview. Um, they don't know anything about the, they don't know anything about the institution. They don't know anything about the cases. They don't know anything about the basic laws that apply there. Um, and I think one of the most important things to do is to be prepared for that opportunity because it may come at a completely unexpected point in time. <coughs> you want to take advantage. And the third thing I would say is um, it depends on which or what field you want to get into. But I would say in terms of at least being a trial practitioner, it's important to have some experience before you come in. Um, I think sometimes uh, uh, younger uh, um, students coming out of school are eager to get into the field right away, um, and it depends, like I said, on where you where you might fit in. But if you're aiming to do trial work, I think you're probably more valued coming in with having had some experience wherever it is that you practice, um, because that brings a value to the office, um, and so it may not be the best the best strategy to come immediately into, um, let's say, the Office of the Prosecutor or Trial Office, it may be better to first hone your skills a little bit at home first um, before before jumping in. Um, so those are the three things I think that are, are, are important. But in, in order of priority, don't give up. That's basically the best advice that I can give anyone. Terrific. Elizabeth? Okay, so I would say diversify your approach. Do whatever you can in the area and the geographical zone that you're in um, to find or create yourself an opportunity that has an interconnectedness to the international field. For example, in Philadelphia, I'm starting on traffic, which have an internet, and I'm certain that that victim-related experience really qualified me for the victim witness unit when I applied at the I. So finding the opportunity and or creating it yourself in the geographical limits you have um, so that you're building experience. A lot of the posts that are open at the entry level throughout the UN 
you'll hear reference to being teach the professional grade two, and they require two years after you finish your years of practice experience at the entry level. You heard me mention that one did take on a, a fixed post with a, a professional level. I had already practiced for several years. Bringing that experience that Kueko mentioned is critical. Um, I and internationally as much as you can. I've mastered the market. I would know and study what are the opportunities um, beyond what list serves you can send the vacancies outward to you so that you're not spending every day online searching. Let the information are not the same in their hiring requirements and practices. And then I would say network as much as you possibly be known in the field because it is field. And so even at the domestic level and the international level, the amount of practitioners tend to know each other. So elevate yourself where you may be uh, through associations, networking opportunities, editing and publishing. But I, uh, network, ask for advice. Never stop asking for advice. And know that many people may uh, be very welcoming to give you advice, but many people will ignore you. And don't, uh, so, so network with no shame. Have a, a strong exterior. <laughs> when people don't know what you email, we are, but you know, you're a stranger and you've emailed saying, I would like some advice, and they never get back. That's okay. Keep going. Keep going. I say uh, network with sh no shame and fearlessness. Um, and I remember an acronym that I used uh, that a uh, Career specialist at Temple University in Philadelphia told me, um, Dean Lennon, and she said, "Air, A R R, ask for advice, ask for ask for a referral to every person you speak to. Referral is an umbrella term. Mean ask for a referral in the literal sense. Refer me to a post. Refer me as a reference letter. Write me a, le a recommendation letter." Or refer me to me know about what you know, you're interested. In. Or just refer me to another source. Refer me to a book, to an article, to a website. So air, A I R. So network with fearlessness, with your heart on your sleeve, and go uh, go after it. Really. That's, that's terrific advice, Philippe. What would you say? Well, I, I say again, from the defense perspective, it's different because we're not constrained by, by all these administrative. Uh, difficulties. So very often we receive directly emails from people who manage to find us from filings. They can see who the lawyers are for, for the, the, the people who are currently facing charges before the tribunals. They manage. It's very easy to find my email uh, from my uh, uh, from my my firm, um, and we get CVs of people, and we hire people like that. So. Um, as interns, or, and sometimes even as eventually as legal assistants. So, um, as Elizabeth said, no, be, be shameless. Just get out there and send. If you are interested in, uh, I would not, not hesitate to simply peruse through the different uh, cases, look at who the lawyers are. You can find their email address and then send um, send your application directly if you want to intern. That's not a problem because um, I, I I think. Yeah, the internship is definitely the, uh, the bridge into this field. So um, that's that's what I would say um, as a final advice. Just find these, these people who are involved in the council and get in touch directly with them. Terrific. Marie-Sophie? Um, well, I think uh, Elizabeth, Kweku, and Philippe have, have made some very valid points, uh, and I echo them. Um, one thing I would say, Definitely what we said about getting experience in domestic jurisdiction, absolutely. Run, if you want to work for the office of the prosecutor, become a prosecutor. Run trials, shut files, um, you know, advise um, investigators as much as you can. Um, be aware that the reality in The Hague is very different from what it is back home, quote unquote, in the sense that, um, in the, sense that the pace is different. Everything takes much longer here, so do not expect to be in court four days a week when you're prepping for trial. That's not going to happen. 
it's not going to happen for years until the trial starts. Um, the distance from the complainants and the crime is also uh, different and sometimes challenging. Um, and since we're talking in terms of getting prepared, I would not underestimate the value of speaking more than one language. Um, in uh, these tribunals, French is definitely an asset at, um, at the STL and at the ICC um, as well. Um, one thing, you know, I think a lot of people who apply for positions um, are very academic and they have amazing background on paper, but in an interview, we, we're not going to ask you what the philosophical pillars of the trial in abstentia are, okay? Like, we're running a trial, so we want to know what is your experience with respect to um, interviewing witnesses, uh, advising investigators, um, collecting, uh, you know, advising the collection of evidence, things that you would do home, you would do here in The Hague, just on a bigger, on a bigger scale. Um, so, yes, that's, those are my thoughts. That, that's terrific. So just to close this down, I'll, I'll just maybe count through some of the themes I heard in everyone's advice. You know, number one was obviously tenacity. Be willing to um, stick with it. It's not going to come easily. It's not like working for a law firm where the law firms come to the law schools, they do the hiring, you do a summer program, you get your offer, you start immediately. It's, it's, there's a lot more legwork involved. Um, the second is, I think many people have mentioned the um, workings of serendipity, sort of being at the right place at the right time, being in a position to seize upon an opportunity that presents itself to you, having the courage to take that jump, that leap of faith in, or, in order to take advantage of something that you maybe didn't plan for but sort of ends up in front of you. Um, following your passion, I think that's clear from a lot of people's comments. Um, even if you end up in uh, an interim position, either for financial reasons or because you have family reasons to be in a particular city, um, keep your eyes on the prize, have an exit strategy, and be positioning yourself in order to make a move later. Your first job is, is not your career. Your second and third job may not be your career. I often tell students that my father was a tree trimmer and a, a stockbroker before he became an art historian. So if he can do that, you know, lawyers can do anything. So there's lots of ways, lots of different pathways to, to get into this field. Um, and it's just a question of, of putting yourself in a position to be prepared to do that. I think it's fair to say that everyone on this uh, Google Hangout is now in your networking circles. So feel free to reach out to us for additional advice or information and also use the American Society of International Law as a platform for doing that sort of networking. I know a number of professionals in this field will be on panels and in attendance at the annual meeting in April in Washington, D.C. And so if that's available to you, I, I encourage you to come and to meet people like us in person um, and to get your name out there and to continue, uh, continue in the field. So thanks, everybody, for participating, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Hangout. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.